Those that heard the words of the songs, were those songs good? Amen. All right, amen, amen. I, lo- I love the chorus of the, of the last song. It just really blesses my heart. Um, there's so many things we can turn our eyes, our attention to, um, and all that we do, all that we experience, circumstances we face. But I'm so thankful that the person of Christ, when we turn to Him, all the things can go away. Amen. I just warms my heart, blesses my soul. And if you're not saved today, you don't understand what I'm talking about. But there's a gospel that can save you. There's a person, it's His gospel, He can save you. And you can know exactly what I'm talking about today. It's a joy uh, to know that um, Christ um, is the answer to all things. He truly is. That's why we're here to worship. Amen? Uh, we're here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Um, you know, this is the last Sunday of 2021. This year has come and it's almost gone. And by God's grace, uh, we have come through this year. Amen? And it's not by your strength. It's not by your intelligence. But it's by the grace of God that we've come through this year. You may have come in and out of sickness. You may have had difficulty uh, in certain aspects of your life, whatever. God's brought you through that. Um, and I'm so thankful for that. And if we make it through 2022, it's by God's grace. It's always God's grace to His glory. And I'm thankful for Him. Um, you know, we've had a theme for this year, just sort of a focal point. And uh, it's the last Sunday, in a sense, to speak about that and uh, just sort of a focus. And that is being completely dependent on the Lord in all things. And so I just want to take a moment and read our theme verse. Um, and I would love for you to join me. You all should know where that's found by now. Uh, in Psalm 121. Turn there quickly if you would. Um, Psalm 121. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together. I would, If you'd entertain me at that, I'd appreciate that. Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2. Thank you, brother. Brother Josh is like this. <clears throat> I'm not the type of, I don't really like drinking water while I'm up here, but push come to shove, you got to do what you got to do, amen? <laughs> I see it sometimes as more of a distraction, but you got sometimes you just got to have a good drink of water, so. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, let's say this together, big and loud, ready, begin. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven. Amen. Amen. Now this year's theme will come to an end, but this scripture is still here. Amen. So don't let that, you know, escape your mind and heart. That's where our help comes from. Comes from the Lord. So very thankful. And I'll say this while you're finding your place in Philippians chapter 3. That's where our text will be today. Um, I'm excited, the um, Lord gave me peace about next year's theme several months ago, I've been working on it and been thinking about the direction of which messages and things to preach certain texts and um, I'm, I'm excited about it, I'm humbled at, at where I have to look at my own life and see where I've got some work to do in my own life to embody this theme that's coming in 2022 the things you're going to hear this morning in, in Philippians chapter 3, you're going to also hear throughout the year, and probably definitely kicking off in, in January. Um, and so, but in chapter 3, we're going to read, it's a little bit lengthy, I can't look at all this in, in its entirety, but I want to read these verses, even if we can't get to all the verses, I want to read them. And, and folks, let me just reiterate, the reading of God's Word should not bore you. Um, and I don't want to get ahead of myself in the message, but there was a day in the first century, and even, even in the time of going through, in the time of Polycarp, and even beyond that a little ways, that's what the people came to hear. It was just the reading of God's Word, and that blessed them. That helped them. That allowed them to grow. And that's, that's where our minds and hearts And our perspective needs to get back to just hearing the Word of God read. 
be able to come, read God's Word, and say amen and leave should give you some growth for your life. Amen? There's a blessing in just hearing His Word read. And so, all right, chapter 3, verse 1 of Philippians. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. God's Word says this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write these same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. And that's not the four-legged kind, by the way. This is referring to a people group, certain sect, religious group. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we, now we're going to spend a lot of time in verse 3 this morning, okay? For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh... If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. This is Paul, okay? But now he's getting ready to go back in time a little bit and remind you who he used to be when he was Saul, okay? He's talking about himself, all right? He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Touching the righteous which is in the law and blameless. That's his pedigree. That's what he was saying. He said, I have so much to brag about um, if I choose to brag in that. But notice where he says here in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted or reckoned loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Doesn't get much lower than dung, I don't think. That's pretty pretty descriptive. That I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many be perfect, or those that are believers in Christ, be thus minded, the perspective, the mind. And if any... uh, and. If in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Last verse. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us, the believers, walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. All right? Let's pray. Father, I come humbly before you this morning. There's so much that has been revolving around in my mind. Thinking about this past year. Thinking about even each one. That makes up this body of believers. Thinking of myself. Thinking of my family. Lord, thinking about our worship. Thinking about church culture today. Father, Lord, help us to have the singularity that you've called us to have. That our minds and hearts, our marriages, our homes, our, our public congregational worship, that we just get back to being just single-minded about what, what, it, what it means to worship, what it means to rejoice, what it means to place confidence only in Christ. We are called to be single-minded toward, toward Christ, and Christ alone. What joy and freedom and peace is brought to us when we do that. And I'm thankful that all that we need in this life is Christ. So, Father, guide us in this message. And I pray that you help my, the, this fumbling, 
preacher makes sense of the text and helps someone this morning through a believer grow in their sanctification and make the gospel clear to those that are lost they can be born again if they would be- repent and believe on Christ alone. And I pray all this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I have a question for you this morning. Um, how many, how many of you, don't have to, you don't have to answer, but how many of you would honestly say, as you look back at this past year, maybe even, even today, and what little of the day that we've been in, that uh, you've had moments when you were distracted? Had some heads raised up when I said that. Distracted. You ever got distracted? You were on task, and then you just, you, you, you just took a dirt road. You just, we were traveling to um, Windsor, to where my, my family, the majority of my uh, immediate family live, and uh, we were on the road, like we were, we were not distracted, we were driving on the pavement, but there was a car that got distracted, and it just, it went off the embankment, it was down in the ditch, and you had the cops there, lights flashing, you know, directing traffic, someone got distracted. Um, distractions doesn't help the believer in this world, amen? Uh, Paul, as you're going to find, brings us to a thought uh, about singularity of true believers, but you may not have just gotten distracted, but maybe, maybe, you just, maybe you just placed more emphasis on the not-so-important things. And you didn't really place enough emphasis on the very crucial, important things. The things that God values more than the other things that maybe you seem to put a little more value or too much value in this past year. Maybe you've made the mistake of, when, when the hard moments came this year, the circumstances shifted on a dime and it went from bright and sunny to stormy and cloudy and stormy and maybe you made the mistake of putting too much confidence in you and not enough confidence in Christ. I would honestly, I think we're all honest, somewhere along you know, these statements you've probably found yourself from time to time. If we're all honest about our, our living this, this whole year. But you're going to find Paul had before his conversion a laser focus of singularity. He was a guy that was focused on the task at hand. He didn't get distracted. Even before his conversion, that was a strength he had. Would you all agree that you can take your strength and place it in things that are very weak? You can focus your strengths on things that does not give a good return to your life. They're the weak and I would say beggarly things. That was, the, that was the life of the Apostle Paul when he was Saul. He said, I had laser focus. I had a strength. And I focused on the things that seemed like the genuine things. But they were weak at best. But here's the blessing about Paul's life. When he became Paul, when he was converted on the Damascus Road, he took that same strength and he put it toward a person. And his name's Jesus. He had a laser focus. He was, he was invested completely in Christ. He made the greater investment with his strength of singularity. Dear friends, we live in a world where this world is fighting for your attention. And I'll say this, there is even church movements that are fighting for the attention of believers as well. The devil himself is fighting for your attention. There's a lot of things that are so much weaker than the real things that's fighting for your attention. And my desire this morning, and I believe Paul's desire here for the the Philippians, and then even us today, is to grasp all of you and, and direct it toward all of Christ. From you as an individual as a husband, as a father, amen, as an employer, wherever you are, a church member, a worshiper of the one true living God, God desires singularity of you toward Him this morning. And I would have to honestly say this and admit, I don't always succeed at this singularity um, toward Christ. Even I get distracted at times. And can I tell you, every time I get distracted, I don't walk away better. Amen. I really start. I really start to build. I build false bridges in my life. I, I, I build false foundations, and they're all they're going to do is let me fall. When I when I lose my focus on Christ, I'm building with other materials, and I'm not only building them for me. I'm building them for my son. I'm building them for my wife. As a pastor, I'm building even foundations. 
I, may, I could even build fa- false, fa- faulty foundations for you this morning. The foundations that you build don't always come under your feet. They come under the feet of your family and others. We need single-minded believers toward Christ in 2022. You have a few days of 2021 left. But you've got, Lord willing, an entire year of um, 2020 or 2021. And so this morning, I want us to draw our attention um, in verse 3. This is where I want to spend most of my time, okay? In verse 3, Paul, there, there is a, there's a distinction out there. There's a group of people that says that we are the true believers. We are the true worshipers. We are the ones doing it right. And it was a group of people that put their focus, their singularity, on external things. The external uh, things of the sacrifices, things of that nature, the keeping of the law, those types of things. But notice what Paul said in verse 3. All right, This is where we're going to spend most of our time. For we are the circumcision. What does he mean by that? Well, the, 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 the Jewish people were given a covenantal sign, right, of physical circumcision for the male. And so that was the identifying covenant to, to the Lord. But we know Christ came and there was a new covenant by grace. And the focus isn't on the external, the, the things that were weaker, that were shadows of the real thing to come, which is Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. But there's a group of people who says, it's the external things that you need to focus on. In worship and in life, it's, it's the ritualistic things. Paul said no. He's talking to the believers here in Philippians. We are the circumcision. And so there's three things here that he says. We're the true worshipers of God in spirit. All right? We are the true rejoicers in Christ Jesus. And we are the ones that put no confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is in the Lord. We that worship God, we that have put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. Romans 2.29 says this, and we'll get started. It says, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Don't forget that. Inward. And circumcision is that of the heart. Again, inward. In the spirit. That's inward. And not in the letter. That's external. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. If there be any praise, if God get any glory, it must come from the inside and directed toward the Lord. All right? I want to begin looking at verse 3. I want to speak to the believers for a moment. All right? Because I want to speak about worship. The priority of worship. He says here that you are the true worshipers. Now listen, if, if God of heaven desires worship... He deserves worship. A true believer, I believe I can speak for all believers this morning, you should desire to worship Him truly. Amen? In a way that He is joyful to receive that worship. The priority of worship. Look at John 4. Would you turn there quickly? John chapter 4. And I'll give you two other verses. I won't have you turn there. But in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, and you, you all know this passage of scripture, but it speaks to the singularity of worship, the priority of worship. And folks, I'm, I'm not speaking of just what, you, what needs to happen in our worship and what's left of this year, but I'm, I'm trying to help you also think about the year to come, Lord willing, about the priority of worship that God enjoys, that He desires. John 4 and verse 23 says, but the hour comes, he's talking to the, the woman at the well. Y'all know this passage. But the hour cometh, and now is when the what? True worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, what's the, what's the next word? Seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him, let's say the rest of this together, must worship Him in spirit. Let me give you two other verses in Romans. All right, just listen to these. Romans 7 and verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, the external. That being dead wherein we, we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. 
Romans 1, 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. There's a couple of things, folks, that we can learn from these verses. It's simply this, there is a distinction, there is a dichotomy between true worshipers and false worshipers. The true worship. The priority of worship that the Father is saying that that I want you to have, that I am seeking. Believers, please pay attention to this. Are those that worship me in a twofold sense. In spirit and in truth. All right? These are key. No matter what all church culture and growth models are trying to throw out you, even in this county, understand this. True worship is in spirit and in truth. It's not in external things, but it's inward things and God's Word. And also to understand that worship is not summarized upon external things, external performances. I want to help you and equip you, dear believer, to worship the true God in a way that pleases Him. Men, you lead your family. I want you to lead your family in true worship. Wouldn't it be a tragic thing, men, to, to stand up one day and accountability to the Lord and say, You did not lead your wife and your children that I gave you in true worship. Men, would that be a tragedy? Can I get some voice from you? Men, amen. We have no reason to falsely worship God. We know exactly how we should worship Him. He says in spirit, go back to even verse 3 in our text, we are uh, which worship God in the spirit. And what's he talking about? Folks, being born again through faith in Jesus Christ, we are freed, dear friend, to worship God in the Spirit. We've been born again. We've been made new inside, internal. There's the new man. There's where the new man dwells. It's in you. And so our worship must come from that new man. And where's the new man? In you. He's given you a new heart. He reside. Where's the Holy Spirit reside? In you. Right? He doesn't come and just perch on my shoulder or some, something on the outside. He's in me. Worship, listen to me, must come from within you. Is what I'm saying. You're born again. You're made new on the inside. Therefore, that what's inside may come what? Come on, church. May come what? Outside. But worship, the priority of worship must be on the inside. It truly, that is what real worship is. There was a group of people that says, oh, no, 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 no. Real worship, it's what we, it's the, it starts on the outside. That's where it begins. It's, 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 the, it's, it's sacrificing these, these animals continually. It's, it's, it's standing up in the synagogue and praying these things out very loudly. It's, what, it's the externals. That's where worship begins. But dear friend, that's not true. If worship ever begins, it begins in you, not outside of you. Now, we have means of which we have singing and things that materializes that worship out from inside you, out of you, right? You sing, so your voice is projected outwardly. We see worship coming out of you, right? Someone may plays an instrument, the talent's in you, and then it's seen coming out of you. Worship starts inside. And folks, we, we don't live in much of a different time than they did. Now, they had the Jewish laws, the sacrifice. We don't have any of that. But, folks, there's a lot of movements today that wants to say worship begins on the outside. It's, it's, it, worship begins when, when you see someone maybe sweat running down their face or just the expression on their face. And you see them up on stage like, man, that's... That's true worship right there. They really know how to worship. And they begin to focus that worship's what you see on the outside. When really it begins in you. Not outside of you. We have a group talking about, you know, it's the things on the external that justifies you before God. And, out, and then beyond that as you live for the Lord, it's the things on the outsides where worship begins. No, no, no. Worship begins on the inside. Side. Vodi Bakum said this. He said, Worship is so much more, listen to me, is so much more than the songs we sing. Maybe you came in this morning, you think, Well, I'm going to go worship and it's going to be just the singing. That's worship. 
No, worship doesn't begin in the, in the hymnal. It doesn't begin when Sister R strikes the first chord. Worship begins in you. You've got to prepare your heart for worship before you ever be ready to worship. Sometimes people will come to church expecting that it's, 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 it's the people that prepares me for worship. If you're going to come and worship on the Lord's day, you should already be preparing your inside to come and worship here outwardly. Amen? Even Clear Springs, I think in some sense, us individually, needs a reformation of worship. Amen? Um, there was a conversation. I've heard this. I've heard this conversation. I've had this conversation with people before. But it goes something like this. Pastor, we've, we've never grown so much more than from, than from your preaching. You're preaching Bible, and we appreciate that, and we've grown so much. This could be from a long-term visitor, even a church member. But then they'll follow it with a but. We just need more from the worship. As almost as if that worship is for you. Dear friend, worship has never been for you. Amen? Worship is not for you. Worship is not something that I give you. Worship is something you give to God. But we have a movement today that says worship is the performance. And I'm not knocking churches that may look a little different than we do. I'm not doing that. But I'm looking a little bit deeper sometimes in the fabric that's way below the surface. And it's driving people's hearts and minds to say, oh, real worship is the performance. It's it's maybe the dimming of the lights or it's this, that, and the other. That's the true worship. Folks, listen to me. You're going to live all of your life and never worship God. I don't want that for you. I want you to worship God. Dear friend, that's going to bring us to truth in just a minute. What really guides us in worship? It's not the song leader, and it's not the pianist, and it's not even the hymnal that regulates our worship. we got to worship in spirit. So dear friend, if you're a believer, you're a worshiper. If you're not a believer, you're not a worshiper. Amen? Um, and I don't mean to spend so much time on this, but it breaks my heart to see people being led in a sense to forget what it means to really worship. It starts in you. Amen? That's where conversion is. Um, It says in in truth. We read that verse over what? In John chapter 4? In truth. Can I tell you, listen to me. This may sound odd to you. But you know who really, and I I don't know if I have done the best of job. This may be a resolution for me or prayer for me this upcoming year. The one who truly leads the worship is the pastor. Now why do you say that? Because he's the one preaching the truth. Amen? Your theology, listen to me. Theology leads your worship. You say, I don't understand that. How would you ever know, how could you worship someone you didn't know anything about? Amen? And where do you learn about God's holiness and His righteousness and His grace and His mercy and the gospel? From where? The Word of God. And where do you hear that primarily on Sunday? From the preached Word of God. Your theology, your theology conditions your worship. It creates your worship. To hear the truth then brings you to celebrate the truth. Amen? It's not external, it's into the truth coming in you brings worship from in you out of you. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you had no truth, your spirit could never worship. Amen? There's got to be both. And so I just I, I want us to see that. I want us to see that this morning. And so The beginning of Paul's knowledge of Jesus Christ was at his conversion, but it did not stop there. If you go back and you look in chapter 3, he says, you know, I've been born again. And he says in verse 8, Yeah, doubtless how can all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And that was his justification. But the growing in my theology of Christ Jesus elevates my worship to Jesus. Folks, that's reason that when you abdicate 
from being under the preaching of the word of God, you're abdicating your position as a worshiper of God. Amen? It's getting quiet. I don't know why it's getting quiet. I'm trying to help you. See, you know, the time this church has set to worship, I'm not getting on a soapbox. I'm, all I'm saying is this. Every time you as a believer can bring yourself to the place where the preaching of the Word of God and biblical theology is being putting out there into your heart, it is growing you as a worshiper of the God who by His grace sent His Son to a virgin's womb, born in a manger that we just celebrated, lived a life, died, resurrected to save your soul. And when you begin to think church is just sort of a buffet thing, no, it is, it is here to help you be the worshiper you need to be for God. Spirit and in truth. Worship is not about you. It's not for you. It's for God. It's not external. You may see the, the, the means that we bring worship out, but it's in you. So folks, don't try to go find a church that... Gives me worship. Okay? Worship's your responsibility. And your responsibility is this. Be under preaching. Be prayerful about, Lord, condition my heart to worship you. There's a priority. But there's a shift. I want you to know there's a shift that it's the externals. No, it's in you. Secondly, i got to move on. The priority of rejoicing. Look at verse 3. Which worship God in the Spirit. And what? Verse 3, rejoice in Christ Jesus. Now Paul makes a strong statement concerning these true, or, or concerning trusting these external religious things as a means of justification. He's like, no, no, I don't, the true, uh, those that rejoice in Christ are not those that trust the, these external rituals, the keeping of the law, the sacrifices, all these things. If you notice what he did with them. You see some phrases in verse 5 through verse, well, even just reading on down through the rest of the chapter. He says, I counted them loss. I counted them but dung. Remember reading that? I counted them but dung in verse 8. Matthew Henry says, He counted them loss, not only insufficient to enrich him, but what was certainly impoverish and ruin him if he trusted to them in opposition to Christ. If you're, if you're saved, you're born again, would you just lift your hand up for just a second? Okay, appreciate that. Your new disposition is this, toward Christ, is rejoicing in Him. That is your disposition. It's not to rejoice in yourself. It's not to rejoice in your job. It's not to rejoice in any external thing. But it's to rejoice in Christ alone. In Christ alone. And can I tell you something? Paul, he uses his own life. He, he's completely transparent. He said, let me tell you why we are the rejoicers. And let me just tell you this by, by my own life. And he does that. And he does that. You, you go on down and, and you read. Um, look, at verse, um, look at verse 8. I count all things but loss for the excellence of knowledge of Christ Jesus. I've suffered the loss of all things. Notice this. And do count them but dung that I may what? Win Christ. That I may be found in him. Not to have my own righteousness. Right? Which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable to his death. He's like, Listen. In those things, these external things within Judaism, there's no Christ there. It's empty. Christ has come. Don't spend your time as what, we, what the Bible calls the shadow of things to come. Things that were looking toward Christ. Christ has come. Rejoice in Him. Don't look for these external means of which to bring you rejoicing to God. Everything that you have to rejoice, God, about happens on the inside. He Listen, if you, he said, if you repent of all things and believe on Christ, you, are, you can be found in Him. Oh, I'm thankful this morning that I'm in Christ. Amen? I am in Christ. Um, Romans 10. Would you turn there for a second? Romans 10. 
Romans 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. I want you to see this. As I said, Paul provides many reasons why the believer rejoices in Jesus Christ. We see them in our text. But I want to also look at some other verses. Romans 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. Jesus, Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 3, um, Jesus provided a perfect righteousness. A perfect righteousness that has been gifted to all who believe. Romans, if you read here, it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, now get this, this is what Paul was saying here. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that, what? Believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. Dear friend, I want you to know something this morning. That we have been given a righteousness that we can never earn our, our own, ourselves. This righteousness that's been given to us to bring us back to God has been done through Christ and Christ alone. Right? Christ alone. Folks, if you remember in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, the tree of life was blocked. God blocked it. They couldn't go back to it. There was, there was separation from them and a holy, righteous, perfect God. There was no way they could get back after they sinned to get back to the tree of life. It was cut off. Even in the, in the temple days, there was a veil that was put between the holy place and the most holy place. There was a cutting off there, this real thick curtain that separated the people from the Ark of the Covenant. There was separation. And there was nothing man could do to get rid of that curtain. But there was one man, the God-man, that did it. And his name is Jesus Christ. He said, listen, I know what I'm talking about. All this, all this religion, all these external things, I was laser focused in them. He would say it in today's terms, I went to church, I tithed, I was faithful, I, was, I taught Sunday school, I, I did all those things. But I didn't have Christ. I never repented and believed on Christ. But oh, now that I have, can I tell you something? Rejoice in Christ. There's no rejoicing in any externals, but it's rejoicing on the person that comes and lives eternally within, in, internally in you so that one day you can live eternally with Him. And it's Jesus Christ. We see here that we may know Him, and knowing Him is equal to trusting Him. You go back to Philippians chapter 3. Isaiah 53, 11 says, He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He said rejoice in the fact that you know Him. You come to that moment where you understood and God worked the knowledge of the truth of Christ within your heart and you believed and life began. He's like, dear friend, you're the worshiper. You're the rejoicer. We've been studying on Wednesday night in Psalm 37 about this wicked world and sometimes it seems like those that are wicked and they, and they don't belong to God, but man, they're just living it up. They have all they want, the wealth and fame and all these things. They're, maybe they're the real rejoicers. No. Because the Bible says those that aren't with God or in God through Christ will one day, they'll be like a byword. They'll just, all the things they have will burn up, will be gone. There is no satisfaction in those things. Being in Him, trusting Him as Savior. Is where the rejoicing is. But he goes on a little bit further. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, also being made conformable unto his death. Folks, can I, I... Now, of course, being a husband, I rejoiced in Christ. And even now that I'm a father, I, I rejoice in Christ even more. With well, the very thing that he just said, being conformable unto his death. When you trust Christ as Savior, listen to me, you died with him. If you trusted Christ as Savior, you resurrected with him. I died and I resurrected. And now that I'm resurrected with him, 
I'm to be still conformed to his death in the sense that I'm to be dead or reckon myself dead to the things that are not godly, that are not holy, that are not righteous, that can hurt my marriage, that can twist the mind of my little boy. I'm thankful, listen to me, that I can reckon myself dead to the things that draw me away from my singularity that God's called me to. To distract my mind to look elsewhere when I don't mean looking only to my wife and looking only to my family and looking only to the church he's called me to pastor and shepherd. All of that is in Christ. Your singularity is not a willpower or a checklist that you have. There's no power in that. The power is in the person that saved you. And it's Christ. If you're going to be true and, 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 uh, to your wife, it's going to be in Christ. If you're going to be the dad you're supposed to be, it's going to be through the power of Christ. Amen? If you're going to be honest in your dealings as an employer, an employee, or whatever you are, a neighbor, it's in Christ. So Paul said, rejoice in Christ. Because all of that is in Him. And if you're born again, it is in you. And he says the resurrection of the dead. And that's experiencing the happiness in heaven. And I, and I, I have to throw in one more, this verse. And I'm going to come to an end, I promise. In, in, in verse 20, for our conversation is where, church? Oh, I hope you didn't close your Bibles. In heaven, from which also we look for who? The Lord who? Jesus Christ. So he says rejoice in him. The resurrection of the dead. I forsaken all, repented, and believed on him for all these things in him. So lastly, I'll give you this. The priority of confidence. You go back to verse 3. And have no confidence in the flesh. I want to just I want to give you a verse. Just, just listen. Uh, Matthew 13, 44. Again. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. What that saying is that his confidence is in that field, that one place, that, that one object. And so it's just sort of symbolizing, if you will, the singularity that we need to have Toward Christ. Amen. That it's him. Sell everything else you got in a sense. I don't mean go sell your home. But nothing else compares to Christ. Receive him. Be focused on him. The priority of your confidence is not in any external. But it is in Christ Jesus alone. Paul's, Paul transitions here. Um, in verse 13 and verse 14. And we'll close with this. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing. Do you see the singularity? This one thing I do. Let's say the rest of verse 13 and read verse 14 together. This will wake you up and we'll come to a close. All right? Starting with forgetting. Ready? Begin. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. My, my confidence, my goal, my direction, my mind, my heart, my, as Paul would say, my entire conversation, it's going toward Christ. And folks, if anything that you've needed or this community, or this world is needed in 2021, it's those pressing toward one mark, one goal, one person, and that's Christ. And the very same thing, can I tell you what people need in 2022? Is, is, is believers that are pressing toward one mark, and one goal, and one person, and that's Christ. Paul transitions from this thought of being justified in Christ to this high calling of God to the believer. I'm pressing toward. I have my marching orders. And he said, they're, they're a joy. They're a pleasure to march. Every step is a joy. It's not, it's, it's not a task. It's a privilege. It's something to praise God for. And let me just, let me just say this in just practicality. 
um, and all that we do, we, our confidence should be in Christ. Amen? Can I get an amen? You know, every ultrasound that we go and we observe, you don't know what information you're going to get, right? Could vary from time to time. And depending on the circumstance, your emotions can change. Your confidence can change, going from a person to just confident in you, right? As we go forward, and even with this second child, we have to say, Lord, we just trust you. No matter what happens with this child, no matter what even the ultrasound may show or whatever the doctor may say, our confidence cannot change into external things. We are not to take a dirt road, a dirt road in self-confidence in, 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 in the sense that I'm speaking of this morning, but in Christ's confidence. No matter what, no matter what, and that's just one, that's just one situation, no matter what maybe the ultrasound may show or the doctor may say, my Savior knows this child. He knows every movement, every breath, every heartbeat, every, every digit on the toe and finger. Hey, listen, my confidence is in the Lord. And that's just one scenario. I'm going to tell you there's a lot of things in this world, circumstances, situations, that's going to stream. Say, hey, shift your confidence. Shift your worship. Shift your rejoicing into something that is just horizontal and external but no Paul says if you've believed on Christ worship inwardly the spirit that lives there worship the Lord rejoice in Christ the one who saved you put your confidence only in him not just the fact of, of, of his salvation that he's given you but in everything you do amen so let me ask you this morning, how single-minded are you toward Christ? Can I ask you, what's your perspective of worship as a believer? Is it, has it been more external things? Or now that you see that it's, worship is not what I thought it was, I've really not worshipped like I thought I was worshipping. You say, man, I've just, I look at this past year and I have seen where I've rejoiced sometimes more than what I've done or what I can do instead of what Christ does for me and in me and through me and all those things that he does. I need to rejoice in him. And I really sometimes have lost confidence in the Lord. Paul says there's no reason to ever lose confidence in the Lord. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.